Pre-Colonial Black Africa by Sheikh Anta Diop Chapter 3 Formation of the Modern European States The end of antiquity coincided with the triumph of Christianity. The latter, in its hierarchical organization, bore the imprint of the temporal organization of the Roman Empire, bishoprics, dioceses, etc., which corresponded to the Roman administrative divisions. The bishop of the capital, Rome, was also to have special importance and become pope. The memory of the Roman Empire, perpetuated by the church, is what constantly impelled the barbarian kings to try to rebuild a universal Christian empire. During the High Middle Ages, there was true intellectual regression. The West was no longer able to carry forward the achievements of antiquity. This was especially striking in the domain of sculpture and architecture. The culture and knowledge achieved in antiquity vegetated in the monasteries to emerge from the beginning in the 13th century. During this period, the church played a positive role in social and intellectual development and in the tempering of behavior. After the failure of the universal empire, national states grew up with the great discoveries, the diffusion of ideas, the existence of an insatiable international market for goods as a consequence of the Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and Norman geographical expeditions. The West was technically less advanced than the East. It was able to overcome to its inferiority only with the help of the Arabs, who beginning in the 7th century, wherever they moved, spread the achievements of antiquity, which had vegetated in Byzantium. Through their philosophers Avicenna and Averroes, Aristotle became known and discussed in the West. They introduced advanced metallurgy, the steelworks of Toledo, Spain. They also introduced the navigator's compass, gunpowder, the use of naval maps, and perhaps the axial helm, which made possible the exact determination of a ship's position. Coasting was no longer necessary, and long-distance sailing with high-side ships came in. In chemistry and mathematics, they also introduced much knowledge derived from the East. The fact that Spain was the first European country to acquire technical supremacy at the dawn of modern times and for a certain period dominate the world can be explained only by the Arab contribution during the time of its colonization. These two facts are not generally connected as closely as they should be. In brief, the Catholic Church on one hand, Islam on the other, were the great preservers of the knowledge of antiquity and contributed greatly over different geographical routes during the Middle Ages to the transmission of this knowledge to the new modern nations about to emerge. From the social point of view, the Middle Ages would see the rise of a bourgeois class alongside the wretched serfs. The situations of the serf, the plebeian and the slave of the father's household were to a certain extent comparable except as concerns their numbers and concentrations. Those of the bourgeois and the African man of caste were not in any way comparable. The former was a once exploited freedman with a conscience full of revolutionary germs driving toward transformation, whereas the latter was in essence conservative. The Political and Social Middle Ages The Western Empire had been dismembered in the 6th century. There followed a period of chaos and barbarism. In 511, Clovis created the Frankish Kingdom with the support of the Church. His descendants became the Do-Nothing Kings, the last of whom was eliminated by the mayor of his palace. 
Pepin the Short was crowned and consecrated by the Pope. This was the origin of the sacrosanct royalty of the West, which was to last until the Revolution. Charlemagne was crowned in the year 800. He created the Holy Roman Empire, provided it with a strong centralized administrative organization, and began a movement of rebirth in the arts, literature, and science. His tutor, Alcuin, played a key role in the unearthing and diffusing of the knowledge of antiquity, especially through his commentary on the works of Aristotle. The transmission to modern man of the trivium, dialects, rhetoric, grammar, and the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, music, was thus assured. The three grandsons of Charlemagne divided the empire among themselves after his death, since succession to the throne was not yet regulated by any precise tradition. Each kingdom would then start to grow weaker and weaker and finally break apart. In the 10th century, invasions by new barbarians, Normans, Hungarians, etc., threw Europe into a time of anarchy and political weakness. Most of the kings had only a title without power and could no longer assure the security of their subjects. This situation forced the subjects to mass around local chiefs strong enough to protect them. The feudal regime was to be born. The lord, who was set himself up on a territory, having constructed on it a fortress of either wood or stone capable of protecting the neighboring peasants in case of an invasion, would become their real chief, and relationships of dependency would become established, the details of which we will examine. Andre Ribard, in his book, the only work of Marxist synthesis published in France in the domain of history, as of 1960, gives a rigorous analysis of the formation of this feudal system. Authority in Europe had not ceased to crumble. Kings remained, but no states. Too far removed from the immediate peril to be effective against invaders, monarchical power no longer constituted a true central government. The notion of the state was eclipsed by that of security. Populations concentrated at spots favorable for resistance. Escaping from pillage alone was the castle, where people and flocks could take refuge while its armed men secured the countryside in the name of the Lord. When the village could no longer be defended, it was abandoned. So this society had to be reorganized around the fortified castle. The effectiveness of the castle dictated a new hierarchy in which the king was merely the nominal suzerain. The essential part being the military caste of lords who decentralized power to their own advantage. Each man put his trust in one more powerful than he. These bonds of vassalage wove a system of protection and servitude in which the Lord was quickly tempted to abuse his authority. Danger would often come from the protector himself. A slow historic gestation thus led to a coherent system. Feudalism. Its greatest flowering was in France, thick with wooden castle keeps, battle command posts for military units split up by regions to fend off the Scandinavian pirates whose penetration was so deep that they supplied the naval terminology of the French language. This organization was just as good as the Lord over it. It really assured some security only if he was courageous and well equipped with men and horses. When during two or three generations the same family had devoted itself to this permanent guerrilla warfare, the feudal lord became the suzerain of a number of territories in which bound together by innumerable traditions of Christian, Germanic, Celtic, or Roman origin, these vassals paid their tributes to him. Military service in the case of his companions, agricultural labor in the case of the peasants. These privileged ones had only to fight. They succeeded so well in enriching themselves that the monarchy, whose wealth lay only in landed estates, rapidly saw these dwindle. 
forced to transfer ever more estates over to these feudal lords, royalty became pauperized. When it ran out of estates to give, it would no longer be able to command. The feudal system would have devoured its authority. What was left to the monarchy was only the theory of its existence. The fact that it was consecrated and that its rank was still called the first. As for the people, they worked. They fed those who were supposed to protect them and whose exactions had now taken a legal turn. The peasants themselves, their families, and their beasts had to foot the bill. Man was free, but subject to so many kinds of tributes that his fate would remain atrocious, for it had become hereditary. The constant dangers threatening this society its poorly upkept roads, the concentration of population, the isolation of markets guaranteed the stability of the new system. Its law would entrench itself, as would its terms, its customs, and its morals. The feudal lords invented a series of imposts which became more and more oppressive, as much for free peasants, freeholders, as for serfs who were bound to the land. The latter could be sold with the land and could transmit nothing by heredity to their descendants except their condition. When several lords held rights to the same land, they divided among themselves the children of the serfs who cultivated it. Marriage was dependent on the will of the lord whose permission had to be obtained. All the apparatus needed for domestic life mill, oven, etc., was located at the castle. All the subjects of the Lord's domain were required to go and make use of them and pay for the privilege. The technique of the feudal system of exploitation, by its exceptionally inhumane character, explains both the jacqueries, which marked the Middle Ages, and the drive with which the inhabitants of the burgs, better concentrated, were to organize in order to wrest political and economic liberty from the lords. Commerce, which was in full bloom, markets, fairs, allowed the artisans and merchants of the cities, despite the condition of the roads, to gain enormous riches. When the lords fell into debt following the Crusades, they would be more and more obliged to sell some of the political and economic liberties to their subjects. Communes would buy their political autonomy and form commercial confederations, such as the Hanseatic League, which grouped nearly 80 German towns with Hamburg as their center. Thus was born the commercial and industrial bourgeoisie, which, by developing, organizing, and gaining education, would become the preponderant political and economic element of the European society that, in short order, it would control. Born in shackles and out of struggle, this bourgeoisie had to become essentially revolutionary and lay-minded. The Intellectual Middle Ages The period of the Middle Ages has been considered in European history as a relatively barbarous epoch of transition, during which the achievements of antiquity were absolutely lost. Most certainly, knowledge regressed enormously, but the guiding thread was never totally cut, and, as early as the time of Charlemagne, the knowledge which had vegetated in the monasteries began to come out. This intellectual movement, which spread from Ireland and England over the entire continent, is undeniable evidence of intellectual continuity. As the Turks occupied Constantinople, destroying the Eastern Empire, and Greek scholars fled to the West, this intellectual movement gained momentum. The Greek writers who had already been given an introduction by the Arabs were now more widely available. We have seen that thanks to Avicenna and Averroes, Aristotle's logic was known and discussed. The intellectual influence of Aristotle the only Greek philosopher to be studied 
was considerable on the thinkers of the Middle Ages. His authority was almost sacrosanct. Thanks to him, they little by little familiarized themselves with the rational scientific manner of thinking. His physics helped more enlightened minds to grasp the idea of positive science divorced from religion. Paul Vigneault has pointed out Alcuin's keen awareness of the ties that united his own time to scholarly antiquity. His praise of the sovereign Charlemagne in another letter defines Alcuin's ideal for us to build in France a new Athens superior to the early one because taught by Christ led by Plato the earlier one shown with the seven liberal arts these liberal arts were the culture to be transmitted 80 years after the death of Alcuin one chronicler judged his work a success the moderns, whether Gauls or Franks, seemed to him the equals of the ancients of Rome and Athens. Sheraton de Troyes was likewise to express the continuity of civilization. At the end of the 12th century, Paris would seem the new Athens. In the 13th century, following Alhazen, the philosophical school of Oxford and Grosseteste and Roger Bacon clearly conceived the idea of positive physical mathematical science. The disciple Bacon, the disciple of Grosseteste, realized that his master had not followed the path laid out by Aristotle, that having known mathematics and optics he might have known everything. The mathematism of Roger Bacon is the sense of potestas mathematicae, the ability of this type of knowledge to discipline the mind and explain nature. In Le Nombre de Or, the golden number, Matilla Gaica demonstrated how vast was the influence of antiquity on the aesthetic and architectural conceptions of the Renaissance. In these last two chapters, we have rapidly reviewed the political social evolution of the European states from antiquity to the formation of the modern nation. The time has come to undertake a detailed comparative study of African political social organizations. End of chapter 3